Hello, I'm Dr. Jared Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory, and today I want to talk about a new clinical trial for MECFS, or myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, that was just started. Uh, this clinical trial is testing low-dose naltrexone, which I'm going to abbreviate LDN, and pyridostigmine bromide, which I'm going to abbreviate PB. So it's actually testing two different treatments in one clinical trial. Now, lotus naltrexone, if you've watched my previous videos, you've seen me talk about lotus naltrexone or LDN many times before. It has some really novel anti-inflammatory effects in the central nervous system. So it works on inflammation in ways that, you know, aspirin and naproxen and acetaminophen don't do. It actually targets central inflammation, which I think is really important in MECFS and similar conditions. So you can check that out. So I won't talk about um, LDN. I've done plenty of videos about that before. Now, PB is the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So now I'm talking about the second drug. So PB blocks the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is important for vascular function, um, blood vessel, heart function, and, and motor muscular function as well. That's what it does in the body. It's also important in the brain. It's critical for learning and memory, general cognition, and, and cognitive processes. So the research team's thought is that in MECFS, the acetylcholine levels may be too low. And that may be particularly the case with people who have orthostatic problems. Um, so PB, when you give it as a treatment, can raise the levels of acetylcholine. That's basically what it does. So the trial is called LIFT, and that's the Life Improvement Trial. There's three main players. There's David Sistrom, and he's a physician out of Harvard. Then there's um, Jonas Berquist out of Uppsala University in Sweden, and then uh, the Open Medicine Foundation, or OMF, which is based out of California around Stanford. And OMF is doing the funding and also driving the recruitment. So I'm not associated with the study in any way whatsoever. They don't even know that I was going to post a video about it. But if you follow my talks, you know I'm very passionate about clinical trials. I think we need way more clinical trials. And so anytime I see something for conditions like MECFS, I will always announce them and let everyone know that there's clinical trials that you might be able to participate in. And this is uh, the case. So this particular trial, I want to talk a little bit about it. And I'll give you my impressions about the trial. So this particular trial is designed to test whether combining LDN plus PB leads to a powerful clinical effect for MECFS. And, and the idea is LDN and PB work in very different ways, but there may be this synergistic effect if they're used together. So to test that question, whether they should make this new combo treatment, they're using a design called a factorial or a two by two design. And I'm gonna show you what that design looks like. If you participate in the trial, you're essentially randomized to one of the four conditions. You might get placebo, you might get lotus naltrexone or LDN, you may get PB, or you may get a combination of the LDN plus the PB. And that approach lets us know whether one of the other drugs is doing most of the work. And so, for example, let's say, and again, just an example I'm making up, let's say that they find that lotus naltrexone was doing 90% of the, the work. If they find something like that, they may conclude that PB is not worth it because when you add two drugs, you're always raising the risk of side effects. We only use one drug when we can get away with it. Or you may find that the individuals in the LDM plus PB group have much better responses. And then that would tell you that these two things should be used together. So a very powerful design. I love the two by two design for clinical trials when you're testing combo treatments. This is the absolutely the best way to do it. And I would never approve a clinical trial that tests two treatments together if it did not use the design that's being used in Lyft. So I'm, I'm really glad that they used that two by two design. Very powerful. So my assessments of the trial. 
as you can see, I like the design. Um, in terms of the treatments, if you follow my work, as I mentioned before, you know that I have a lot of uh, optimism in LDN, or at least a lot of interest in it. I think it needs to be studied. Now, PB, I know less about. I'm very familiar with its central effects, but I know very little. I'm not a cardiovascular person, so the impacts on the heart and the vessels and the muscles is not my area, and so I can't speak much to its effectiveness in that realm, except that it is some, uh, you know, a treatment that is considered in a number of different conditions. Uh, other pros, the study is recruiting 160 individuals, so it's a nice medium-sized trial, and there are very few medium-sized trials in MECFS. So I'm really glad to see something that's not in 10 people or 20 people. This is this has a lot of good people in it, or a, a large number. Now, uh, because of the design, there's a limitation of the design, which you may already be thinking about, which is if you have four conditions, you have to divide four into 160, which means you're splitting up that really nice group into four conditions. So there's only going to be 40 individuals per condition. That's an okay number, but it starts to get towards the smaller size, um, which means you lose your sensitivity to detect smaller effects. So if the clinical effect is huge, like if this just makes everyone better, 40 will be absolutely fine. They'll easily find the effect. If the clinical effect is too small, they may miss it with 40 people per group. Or if there's a lot of variability, if it works for a lot of people, but it doesn't work for a lot of other people, they might miss that clinical effect with 40 people per group. Now they know this, there's there's no surprises here. The fact is, is that when you run a clinical trial, you have a budget, you have priorities, and every clinical study involves making sacrifices and compromises. There's no such thing as a perfect trial. So I think they were very wise with the resources they had, made very good decisions. And these are not complaints. They're just every study, every study I do has limitations to discuss. So I talked about sample size. I, you know, I think if they find something interesting, they'll follow up with a larger trial to be absolutely sure, which is very typical in um, clinical trial study world. Um, other cons, uh, there's some concerns with the use of PB. You know, basically, if your levels of acetylcholine are low, then giving PB will raise your acetylcholine levels, and that should fix the problem that's being caused by low acetylcholine. But if your levels are normal, or if your levels are kind of normal high, then giving PB could boost your acetylcholine too much. And there are a lot of side effects that are associated with having too high of a level of acetylcholine. So that's something that could happen. I would expect there to be some side effects with individuals who have higher acetylcholine levels to begin with, and they don't need to boost those levels. Now I'm guessing, I don't know the protocol for the study. I don't know what blood tests they run. I'm guessing that they're gonna measure acetylcholine or they're gonna run clinical tests that serve as proxies for measuring acetylcholine. But I don't know that for sure, but I'm just assuming they're gonna look for uh, biomarkers and it would make sense to somehow measure acetylcholine. So I'm sure they have really good protocols in place to monitor potential side effects and to avoid side effects that are expected. Uh, another limitation of the study is that it has, participants have to be around Harvard, Massachusetts. So they have to be within a hundred miles, I think, radius. And that's because there's multiple study visits, three or four study visits, I think. So you have to be close to participate. And that is completely justifiable. It's not a criticism of the study. It's, it's how you have to do it. Whenever you're testing two drugs together, you don't know what's going to happen. And that is not the kind of study you want to be doing remotely and having people way out in the middle of nowhere participating. It's just not safe enough. So, you know, given the fact that this is a new approach to treating MECFS, they really need to keep the people close to the study site. And so they're doing exactly what, what they should in that case. But it is a limitation. It means if you don't live 100 miles from Harvard, you can't participate right now in this study. And 
That excludes most people in the United States, but that's the way it is. So anyway, if you want more details about the study, this is registered on clinicaltrials.gov, which it should be. I put a link in the description box so you can go straight to it. I'm also showing the page to you right here, but go click on the link. Uh, that's what it's for, clinical trials, is so everyone in the world can read the details on the trial. I'm also going to put a link to the Open Medicine Foundation, their sign-up page. That's in the description box as well. I'm not sure how OMF is handling recruitment, but it looks like they, they, I mean, I know they have a large registry. It looks like what they're doing for this study is inviting people to join the registry, and then they'll screen the people in the registry to see if they meet the basic criteria, like they live within 100 miles of Harvard, and then they'll invite those people to participate in the study. That's what it looks like. So if you're interested, if you live close to Harvard uh, and you're interested in participating in that trial, or if you just want to be an OMS registry, I just gave you the site where you can do that and be included. And then if other trials come up, you'll be in the registry already and they may reach out to you to participate. So that's the best way to be involved with OMF funded studies. So I, I wish the research team the best of luck. Um, David out of Harvard and Jonas out of Sweden and Linda, uh, who's running uh, the Open Medicine Foundation. And I'm really excited to see a new trial. This trial is designed to be wrapped up in two years. Now, that means we won't hear anything probably for two years. That's a bummer. That's just the way clinical trials are. They take a long time to get off the ground and a long time to run and analyze. So it's going to be quiet in terms of this study. And, you know, I've been doing this for quite a while, and I know that two years for a clinical study usually means it ends up being three or four years. That's not a criticism of this team. That's just what usually happens with any clinical team. It just ends up being more complicated. And sometimes there are delays or unexpected things that come up. But that doesn't mean that's going to happen to this study. They may have everything done in two years and we'll have results a couple of years from now. That's very possible. I'm just saying typically in almost all cases, it takes longer than originally projected. So I'm just saying it may be a while before we hear something. I don't think they're planning on doing interim analyses, which are analyses before they finish. So I don't think we're going to get any sneak peeks of what's going on until they finished. And that's totally appropriate. That's what they should do because the sample size is so small per condition. It's not worth taking sneak peeks. It's just there'll be too few people to make any conclusions. So they need to finish the study and then we'll see what the results look like. So the only way we'll talk about the study in the meantime is if another study testing one of those treatments comes out and it changes the way that we look at this trial. I don't expect that to happen, but but it's possible. Anyway, bottom line, it'll probably be a, a while before I talk about this study again. And I hope the next time I talk about it, there's some really exciting, interesting uh, news from it. So that's it for today. I just wanted to announce this trial. Uh, a really quick heads up. I am dealing with a monstrous deadline in the next six weeks that is going to keep me occupied almost all of my waking time. So <clears throat> I'm still going to do the weekly videos no matter what. They may not be super long, but I may keep them short, but they'll still be packed with good information. But the, uh, the bottom line, I guess, is that while I'll still look at the questions and comments, I really like uh, the, the active discussion that that you've had with the videos and I answer as many questions as I can. And I really like the, um, the perspectives and I take a lot of notes. Sometimes I add ideas to my list of ideas and drugs to the list of things I'm testing. So I really uh, hope everyone is able to continue that discussion to the videos. But anyway, what I'm saying is over the next six weeks, I probably won't have a lot of time to respond to many of the comments, but I will read them all. And then after six weeks, I should be back to normal and responding to, to more of the comments. So I just wanted to give you a heads up uh, about that. And I'll tell you what I'm working on later, but I, I can't really talk about it now. But as soon as I can, I will. So that's it. I uh, hope you have a good week and I'll be back a week from now on Monday with more interesting and important stuff.